Welcome back to Historical American Girl Read Alouds. We are reading chapter three of Meet Kaya today. In the last chapter, Kaya got a nickname, Magpie, that she did not like very much. And she was pretty sad about. So today we'll have to see if she's able to do anything to get rid of that nickname. You may remember that our story takes place in the area that's today parts of Idaho, Washington State, and Oregon. So if you see here on the map, Kaya lives way over in the northwest corner of the United States. So you can see where she lived in comparison to Felicity, Kit, and Josefina. So they all lived in very different parts of the United States. And the area where Kaya lives very much affected her life because that's what they could use to build their homes and to eat and to survive, the things that were found around them. Chapter three is called Courtship Dance. One morning after many days of clear skies, dark clouds rolled over the mountains and rain pelted down. The tool reeds of the teepee coverings swelled with water and kept out the rain. The women turned from preparing food to work that they could do inside the dry, cozy teepees until the storm passed. Ala took out the hemp cord and the bear grass she needed to weave some flat bags. She dyed the bear grass soft shades of red, green, and yellow. She gave some brown cord to Kaya, then started a bag for speaking rain to work on. Although Speaking Rain couldn't see, she could make fine cord and could weave by touch once Ala set the first rose. Itza and Brown Deer were mending moccasins for the twins who napped on their deer skins. As he always did, Wing Feather slept with his hand tucked into his baby moccasin, which he cradled under his chin. For a long time, they worked in silence. Kaya liked the quiet teepee. The sound of rain falling on the tool mats soothed her. In fact, she wished she could stay inside their teepee where no one called her magpie and never go out again. And here's some tool reed mats that she's sitting on right here. The tool that's right now covering the outside of their teepee and keeping the rain out looks like this. Ala touched Kaya's weaving to show her where her work was lumpy and uneven. You're awake, but you're dreaming, Ala said. Will you tell me your dream? Kaya undid the line of weaving and started it over. She didn't want to admit how much that nickname still troubled her. I was dreaming about my horse, she said. When I was a girl, we didn't dream of horses. Allah said with a smile. When I was a girl, we didn't even have horses. We when we traveled, we walked on our own two feet and our strong dogs pulled our loads for us. You know about these things, Itza said respectfully, but dogs couldn't pull the big loads that our horses do. And we couldn't travel as fast on foot as we can on horseback. But our scouts could run fast, Allah said. The scouts who lived near the trail to enemy country ran as fast as the wind to warn of us of danger. Allah's fingers flew as she wove the bag. Already she'd finished a plain border and was adding a lovely pattern of triangles. So her bag probably looked something like this one. You can see the triangle patterns on this one, and it's woven together with handles so that they could carry things in it. It's true, the scouts were swift, Itza said, but no man runs as fast as a horse. No man can travel as far on foot as he can on horseback. She began sewing a new sole onto a moccasin with a length of sinew. Now the men ride far away, but often they don't come back for a long, long time, Allah said. Things were better in the old days. 
I can't imagine our warriors without their horses, Brown Deer said softly. A warrior is so fierce on horseback. He fights so bravely. Our men were brave warriors long before they ever heard of horses, Allah said. And because we have horses, our enemies make more raids on us. Ahe, Itza said, you're right. But without his horse, my husband wouldn't be such a good hunter. He couldn't bring us so much meat. He always gives meat to the old people too. Horses are so beautiful, Kaya chimed in, especially the spotted ones like Steps High. She imagined her horse running with her head held high and her black tail streaming. Was it boasting to call her beautiful? Allah reached for Kaya's bag and gently took it from her. When Allah put the tip of her finger through a hole in a loose row, Kaya realized that she hadn't made the weaving tight enough. She began to unravel her work so that she could make it better. Allah, you've often said we need horses for many things, Brown Deer said. Allah sighed deeply. I've said so. And it's true, she said. The old days are gone. We can't unravel our lives and begin them again as Kaya is doing with her weaving. She put down her work and placed her hands on her knees. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to tell you something. Kaya and Speaking Rain laid down their weaving at once. Itza and Brown Deer stopped sewing. When Allah spoke like that, she wanted their attention. I've lived a long time, and I remember many things, Allah said. Isn't that so? Itza and Brown Deer nodded. Ahe, Kaya in Speaking Rain said. One thing I remember is the time of terrible sickness, Allah said. Traders told us about strangers with pale, hairy faces who rode from far away to trade at the big river. With the strangers on horses came a sickness of fevers and blisters, a sickness we've never known before. My people never saw the strangers with pale faces, but their sickness came to us anyway. Many, many people sickened and died. The most powerful medicine man had no medicine to cure this new sickness. Allah was quiet for a while, gazing into space. Then she ran her hands across her cheeks. You see these pockmarks on my face, she said. I was one who got the sickness. My own mother died of it. I've told you that too. These pockmarks remind me how few of us survived. They remind me that not just good things came into our lives with the horses but the marks also remind me to be strong and help others. Kaya looked at Allah's so solemn face. She knew Allah was thinking about the bad times in the past. Kaya was ashamed to be worrying about an unpleasant nickname when so much suffering had come to others. Would difficult times like the sickness come again to the Nimipu? We've talked enough of that, Allah said. It's time to go back to work. Kaya began her weaving again, making each twist of cord as firm and as tight as possible. When she grew up, she wanted to be a wise, strong woman like Allah. So Allah was talking about the time before the Nimipu had horses. They didn't always have them, and they had many ways of life that worked for them at that time. But then white people introduced horses to the United States and eventually they got all the way to the West Coast or the Northwest region where the Namipu were and they started to raise horses. The Namipu became known as a tribe who bred great strong horses and that became one of the things that they were especially famous for. But with the white people, the people with pale, hairy faces that her grandma was talking about, also came smallpox. 
and that was a disease that killed many Native Americans, like Kaya's grandmother's mother. And so her grandmother, Allah, still has the pockmarks on her face from that disease. The men are getting out the drums again, Speaking Rain said. Soon they'll start singing, listen. Kaya listened. From across the camp came the first drum beats. Every evening, drumming, songs, and laughter filled the air. In the middle of the camp, Tota and some other men were playing the stick game, joking and shouting as they made their guesses. The women watched and chatted with their friends. The children chased each other and played games. Soon there would be dancing too, until it was time for the men to light fires along the riverbank and begin their night fishing. Kaya loved being part of so much excitement. In their teepee, Kaya watched Brown Deer dressing herself for the courtship dance. Brown Deer put on her best dress, decorated with porcupine quills and elk teeth. She tied on her wide belt and hung a small woven bag from it. She smoothed the ankle flaps of her moccasins and tied them neatly. Your dress is so beautiful, Kaya exclaimed. Speaking Rain folded her arms and grinned up at her older sister. Tell us, who do you want to dance with tonight? I don't know, Brown Deer said with a shrug and the flicker of a smile. As Brown Deer hurried to join the other girls, Kaya thought her big sister was the prettiest girl in the whole village. Kaya and Speaking Rain followed her out of the teepee. In the light of the rising moon, the twins were dancing, hopping about and bobbing their heads like quail. Wingfeather beat two sticks together. Sparrow turned around and around until he was dizzy and fell to his knees. Kaya was too young to join the courtship dance, but the drum beats and singing made her want to whirl around and around like Sparrow. They made her want to beat the rhythm like wing feather. As Kaya listened, she practiced dancing by taking small steps, moving in place. Who could resist the drums? On one side of the clearing, the older girls began to form a circle. The older boys formed a circle around the girls for the courtship dance. In this dance, a boy tried to dance beside the girl he liked best. If a girl let him stay by her side, that meant she liked him best too. Most families decided who would marry whom, but some paid attention to the choices of the dancers in the courtship dance. Brown deer's dancing near us, Kaya whispered to Speaking Rain. Is she looking at any special boy? Speaking Rain asked. She looks at all the boys but one, Kaya said. She never looks at Cut Cheek. Cut Cheek was slim and strong. He was a good hunter and a good dancer too. The scar on his cheek only made him better looking, Kaya thought. She'd often seen him glance at Brown Deer as he danced, but Brown Deer never returned his gaze. When Cut Cheek comes near, Brown Deer looks at her moccasins, Kaya said. I don't think she likes him at all. Speaking Rain giggled. Kaya, you're foolish, she said. If Brown Deer can't bring herself to look at Cut Cheek, that means she really likes him. But how will he know she likes him if she never looks at him? Kaya wondered. He'll know, Speaking Rain said. All the young men and women were in the circle now. When the drum beats changed, the boys and girls danced slowly forward toward each other. The long fringes on the girls' dresses rippled and swung as the girls moved. The drums seemed to be saying, come dance with me, dance with me. With exciting music like this, how could the dancers keep their steps so steady and even? Where's Cut Cheek dancing? Speaking Rain asked. 
He's on the other side of the circle, Kaya said. I don't think he'll be able to get near brown deer. The dancers move closer to each other, then away, then close again. The next time they were close, a boy eased himself out of his line and placed a stick on a girl's right shoulder. She kept the stick on her shoulder and made room for him by her side. Now they danced as a couple. The dancers moved toward each other again. As they advanced, Cut Cheek managed to move past the boy next to him. Now he was almost in front of Brown Deer. She held her chin high and looked straight ahead. She made the fringe on her dress snap with each graceful step. What's happening now? Speaking Rain demanded. Cut Cheek keeps moving closer to Brown Deer, Kaya said. Again, the dancers moved forward. The boy called Jumps Back moved opposite Brown Deer. He was short with broad shoulders. Although he often liked to tease the girls, now he looked very serious. When Brown Deer danced close to him, Jumps Back stepped beside her and placed his stick on her shoulder. With a shrug, she knocked the stick off. Jumps Back bent to pick up his stick and Cut Cheek moved into his place. Now he was opposite Brown Deer. Brown Deer just turned down Jumps Back, Kaya told Speaking Rain. Cut Cheek is right in front of her, but she's looking past him as if she doesn't know he's there. Oh, she knows he's there, Speaking Rain giggled. The next time the dancers were close, Cut Cheek left the boy's line. His dark face was gleaming. He stepped next to Brown Deer and placed his stick on her shoulder. Blushing, she took a deep breath as if she were about to dive into deep water. She let his stick stay on her shoulder, and they danced now side by side. She chose Cut Cheek, Kaya said. She didn't hesitate for a moment. The run of salmon up the river was coming to an end. Many, many salmon had given themselves to Namipu. The women had packed the dried salmon into large woven bag and parfleches made of rawhide. Now they were packing up their belongings as well. Soon the women would roll up the tulle mat coverings of the teepees and take down the teepee poles. They would put everything they owned on their horses and the travois and set out. It was time to move higher into the mountains so that the women could pick huckleberries and the men could hunt for elk and deer. Kaya and her family would be part of the group traveling back to Salmon River country. Ala called Kaya to her. She looked worried. I think I left my knife where we were working yesterday. Ala said. I'll go look carefully, Kaya said. Kaya already had a rope bit on steps high. She'd been riding her horse every day, keeping her tightly reined in and held to a trot. Steps high hadn't once tried to buck off Kaya, but Kaya hadn't yet asked Tota if it was safe to run her horse again. May I come with you, Kaya? Speaking Rain asked. Kaya gave Speaking Rain her hand and pulled her sister up onto the horse to sit behind her. Riding bareback, they trotted away from the camp. At the river, they passed Tota and a few other men fishing for the last of the salmon. As the men speared fish, Foxtail and some other boys put the salmon into baskets. Tota stood on the bank with his back to the sun. He had placed a large white stone in the current where the river was shallow. When a fish swam between the white stone and Tota, he could see its outline and spear it. Downstream where the river was deeper, Ala had been cleaning fish on the bank the day before. Kaya reined in steps high. I'll start searching a little way down the path and make my way back to you. Kaya told Speaking Rain. Wait here to mark where I start my search. 
speaking rain slipped off steps high. As Kaya rode on down the path, she looked for her grandmother's knife. Steps high was tense and skittish. She shied at a garter snake crossing the path, but Kaya steadied her. When Steps High shied a second time, Kaya reined her in. What's the matter, girl? Kaya said. What's spooking you? Steps High snorted and pawed the ground. Kaya shaded her eyes and looked back to where Speaking Rain had been waiting. Speaking Rain was cautiously making her way through the elderberry bushes that grew along the riverbank. She couldn't know there was a steep bank on the other side of the bushes. Stop, Speaking Rain, Kaya called. She turned steps high and started back. Speaking Rain didn't seem to hear Kaya's call. Were stick people leading her astray? She kept going. Stop, don't take another step, Kaya cried. Now, Speaking Rain heard Kaya's cry. She stopped and turned. As she did, a piece of the bank crumbled beneath her feet. Speaking Rain fell backward. In a shower of stones, she tumbled into the swift river. And that's the end of chapter three. Wow. A tense time to stop. I wonder what will happen to her poor blind sister speaking rain. In part of this chapter, it talked about how the salmon had given themselves up for the Namipu. And that's the way that the Namipu people looked at animals that died in order for them to eat and to make their clothing and homes and things. They looked at it as if the animal made a sacrifice for them. And so that's what it meant when it said the salmon gave themselves up for them. They were very grateful and respectful of the animals and nature around them that provided life for them. You can see that the people had to travel to go with the seasons. The salmon would swim upstream once a year, and so they would travel there when it was easy to catch the salmon. When it was time for different plants to bloom and be harvested, they would go to where those plants and things were harvested too. So I have some pictures to show you in the Welcome to Kaya's World book that shows more about life in 1764. This first one shows what a travoy is. So a travoy was sticks put up against a horse or before they had horses against their dogs where they could strap things and carry things. And in this picture of the travoy, there's a young child on the seat. You can also see the spotted horses that Kaya said were her favorite. The Nimipu people were famous for those types of horses. On this page, you can see the weaving that they were doing when they were in the teepee. The Nimipu were known for making these kind of woven hats that you see. They almost look like upside down baskets in the picture. And you can see the types of bags that Kaya and her family were working on, things a lot like the one that she has here. And that would carry their food after they dried it. It also men mentioned something called parfleches. And here it shows a close-up of what parfleches would look like. And these would be made out of skin from animals like deer, elk, or buffalo rawhides, and then they would be painted. This is the parflesh that comes with the American Girl stuff. This one doesn't look like it's actually made of rawhide like the ones in the book. This one looks more like it's of the same weaving as the basket, but it does have some of the same patterns. In the picture here, it says green paint was made from algae skimmed from still ponds. Bright yellow paint could be made from lichens or gallstones from a buffalo's gallbladder. 
berries, minerals, or even pussy willow buds made many shades of red. Bone painting tools, often made from buffalo shoulder blades or hip bones, soaked up paint and gave an even smooth flow of color. Sticks of willow or cottonwood with their ends frayed made stiff paintbrushes. Willow sticks stripped of their bark helped artists make straight lines. Shades of blue were made from berries, crushed flowers, dark blue clay found along streams, or even duck droppings. Ugh. In modern times, women still use parfleches for storage as decorations for their horses and for giveaways. And then this next part of the book shows some of the foods that we've heard about them having in the story so far. The finger cakes, the kamas root, the huckleberries, and elderberries. And Kaya does have a basket that looks like this that has some of the elderberries and the camas root all mashed up. And I think this is maybe supposed to be an onion. So those are some of the items that Kaya has that were made by American Girl to show what their life was like. In the picture in the book, it shows digging sticks that were used to pry roots out of the ground, and a mortal and pestle that were used to smash up the berries to make cakes. The mortar or bowl usually had a stone base and woven basket sides, which is interesting. It's similar to the one that Josefina had, but hers was just a stone base and a stone that they smashed with. This one has a basket woven around the stone base. So that's it for chapter three. Some interesting things today. The courtship dance was another interesting thing that the tradition that we heard about today where the young men and women were able to show who they liked and hopefully would marry. But at the very end, poor speaking rain had fallen into the river. So hurry back next time to see what happens to speaking.